policymakers, scholars, and business leaders in the hope and the belief that a frank and open dialogue will lead to better understanding, cooperation, and positive public policy. Today we are fortunate to have with us Peter Voser, one of the world's foremost business leaders. Shell is a global group of energy and petrochemical companies with its headquarters in The Hague. Peter Voser took over the role of CEO of Royal Dutch Shell on July 1, 2009. And prior to this, Peter was the chief financial officer and executive director, director of the company. He first joined Shell in 1982 after graduating in business administration from the University of Applied Sciences in Zurich. Peter has served in a variety of business and financial roles in Shell, at Shell, serving in Switzerland, the UK, Argentina, and Chile. In 2002, Peter left Shell to become CFO and a member of the Group Executive Committee for Isaiah Brown Bavari, group of companies based in Zurich, before returning back to Shell as CFO. Peter serves on the board of directors for UBS and is a member of the Swiss Federal Auditor Oversight Authority. I thought everybody would like to know a little bit about some Shell, some interesting facts. Royal Dutch Shell this year holds the number one, and I repeat, the number one ranking of global Fortune 500 companies. It operates in more than 100 countries, has about 102,000 employees, and produces about 2% of the world's oil and 3% of the world's gas. Shell produces 3.2 million barrels of oil every day, and there are about 45,000 Shell service stations around the world. There's no doubt that Peter Voser has both a difficult and an important job. So please join me in welcoming him to the Wilson Center, and we look forward to your comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and give you uh, my views on the energy company of the future. And I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Woodrow Wilson once said, one cool judgment is worth a thousand hasty counsels. The thing is to supply light and not heat. I share his preference for cool judgment, especially at the time of big changes in the energy industry. But if President Wilson and I had been around at the same time, I would have pointed out that heat is one of the energy's great gifts. The ability to control fire gave prehistoric human groups protection against cold and darkness. It enhanced group life, communication and solidarity, allowed them to cook food and made hunting and agriculture easier. So today, more than ever, energy is the lifeblood of human civilization. Without energy, there would be no heating, light, air conditioning or washing machines, no tumble dryers or dishwashers, no clean drinking water or sewage systems, no planes or cars, no internet, computers, television or mobile phones, no plastics, and certainly no modern health care. So if we think the price of energy is too high, would we want to try the cost of having no energy? Harvesting energy and bringing it to an end use is prob probably entails the largest, most complex and costly logistical effort on Earth. If the human race was an, an ant colony, the energy industry would be its workers. For instance, in 2008, Shell staff and contractors in our downstream business alone drove nearly a billion miles, which is more than a hundred times around the globe every day, to bring energy to our customers. The International Energy Agency has warned that the world needs to invest around $26 trillion in energy supplies up to 2030. On IMF calculations, that's more than 30 times, 3-0, and the amount which governments globally have used so far to save banks and revive their economies. So perhaps it's time we shall start and all appreciate the true value of energy and the value of saving energy. 
Energy companies like Shell sit at the nexus of one of the world's most difficult and exciting challenges. Building a new energy system capable of meeting the energy needs of future generations at much reduced environmental cost. At Shell, that responsibility is a source of inspiration for our people, and we work hard to make it a source of trust for our customers. It's time to examine what energy companies might be doing in the future and how they will do it in two steps, I think. First, let's look at long-term trends in the global energy system. And then second, if we zoom in on energy customers, how are their demands changing? What can we say about their future aspirations and how might energy companies respond to that? Now, Peter Drucker once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. True. The most successful companies will be those that embrace new ways of thinking, take risks and anticipate evolving customers which want, who once before others do so. Some of you may think, if that's true, oil and gas companies should switch to renewable energies immediately, since that is where the future growth will be. Now, I don't see this quite the same way. Re renewable energy, while important and necessary, is not the silver bullet that's going to solve all of our problems, at least not for a long time yet. Historically, it has taken at least 25 years for any new energy type to concur 1% of the global market. That's been true for liquefied natural gas in the past. Biofuels are reaching that mark about now. Wind could do so sometime in the next decade, 25 years after the first big wind farms were built here in the US and in Denmark. So many of the raw materials on which the growth of renewable energy depends come with supply constraints and environmental challenges. For instance, the lithium that's used in batteries in electric vehicles can currently only be produced easily in a very few places on Earth, often through the use of toxic chemicals. If you were to make a big shift to electric vehicles, the cap capacity for mining lithium responsibly and sustainably would also have to expand. The wind industry needs neodymium for magnets in the turbines. Neodymium is a rare earth metal. While abundant in the earth's crust, bigger concentrations are rare and difficult to produce in environmentally friendly ways. Rare earth materials in the US were, or these mines were closed in the past for environmental and economic reasons. Today, more than 90% of the world's neodymium comes from China, which recently indicated it might tighten export controls on this. So this underscores the importance of making responsible use of all the Earth's pre, uh, natural resources. It also serves as a reminder that countries are well advised to spread their energy risks by increasing the diversity of their energy supplies. So what's the Shell response to all of this? Complex challenges rarely have simple solutions. Shell's response has been multifaceted. We develop scenarios and share them with the outside world. We invest more in new energy projects than any other private company. We spend more on research and development than any of our competitors. And we develop new businesses, including in the renewable energies. That said, we cannot innovate in all directions. We have to focus on our own skills and capabilities. We are not a government. We are a business. 
The key is to be in the right segment of the right market at the right time. Are we? Yeah, well, judge for yourself. The global energy market is growing. Within that market, oil and gas are both indispensable and our core business. And within that segment, Shell is increasingly focusing on natural gas, the cleanest burning fossil fuel. By 2012, natural gas will likely make up around half of our production. This is not merely a shift in our portfolio. Increasing natural gas production and transportation by liquefying it and shipping the LNG, the liquefied natural gas, to global markets means that more natural gas will be available to displace coal as the fuel for power plants. A natural gas-fired power plant emits on average half the CO2 of a coal-burning plant to produce the same amount of electricity. It also generates significantly less local pollution. In fact, coal-fired electricity is responsible for the fastest growth in greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So it is urgent that we address that. Supplying more natural gas is one way of doing that. In the United States, new technology has <coughs> opened up abundant gas resources contained in dense rock formations, increasing supplies dramatically. So you can see why I'm sometimes tempted to say nothing beats natural gas. When you are in the right place today, there is still the question. Will you be there tomorrow? This is the $3 trillion question confronting all oil and gas companies. Fortunately, taking the long-term view is very much part of Shell's DNA. For example, early last century, Shell planners foresaw that aviation would become a normal way of transport. So Shell supplied fuel for the first non-stop transatlantic flight in 1919 by British aviators Alcock and Brown and for most pioneering flights in the 10 years that followed. Today, Shell refuels a plane every 12 seconds. Similarly, we foresaw in the 1960s that there would be a demand for liquefied natural gas and we are now a global leader in that market. An early differentiated transport fuel, Shell Racing Spirit, it was called, dates back to the 1920s. Today, Shell is the world's most popular brand for transport fuel. In the United States alone, there are over 14,000 Shell branded retail stations. Someone said to me that's more than double the number of Taco Bell restaurants. Looking out to the coming decades, energy demand in the developing world will continue to grow and it will be difficult to supply these growing energy needs even if we produce energy from all of the world's known resources. There is plenty of energy around today as a result of the recession which we are going through, but the drop in investment makes a future supply crunch a plausible scenario. To make matters more complex, climate pressure is increasing. These trends have also begun to affect the wants, needs and future aspirations of our customers. Customers include the millions of people and companies who buy our products every day, the local communities and governments who host our operations and projects, the research institutes with whom we work together to develop new technologies and the NGOs who want to help improve our environmental and social performance. So let's take a closer look at three of these groups, which are the motorists, the producing nations and the consumer nations. Car drivers want easy access to affordable transport fuel that takes them a long distance. That's nothing new. What has changed is the growing desire for driving that is fun, useful and environmentally acceptable. 
This trend of cleaner driving is likely to continue, including in the United States, with fuel efficiency standards getting ever tighter. The desire of cleaner transport plays to sh uh, sorry, the desire for cleaner transport plays to shell strengths as the world's largest distributor of transport fuel. So our new role goes beyond serving our customers efficiently. We will have to build and cater for a growing community of energy customers who want to feel good about the energy they use. We can offer them fuel-saving transport fuels and lubricants. We can blend in sustainable biofuels. We can capture CO2 at the point of production and store it on the ground. And we plan to do at Canada's, like we plan to do it at, at Canada's oil sands. We also help our customers to reduce their fuel consumption. For instance, in a program called Fuel Safe, we have trained more than 130,000 car drivers in different countries to cut their fuel consumption by 10 to 20 percent just by driving differently. So our philosophy is that customers who save fuel spend less money and happy customers tend to be loyal customers. Now I can almost hear the question, what's about electric mobility? So let me be clear. We at Shell, we don't oppose electric mobility. Why would we? Our future customer will decide which type of fuel they want to buy. And we will embrace that and work hard to help them realize their aspirations. Over a billion new vehicles are expected to come onto the, to the world's roads between now and 2050. That's more than doubling what we have today. So there will be room and need for many different fuel types, including conventional fuels, biofuels, and electricity. And as I said earlier, Shell supplies natural gas for electricity. We also offer gasification technologies that would enable a cleaner use of coal and more effective application of CO2 capture technologies and we produce wind power. So all of which, to be absolutely clear, is necessary to make electric mobility possible in the first place. So I challenge anyone to paint a plausible mobility future without the role for a company like, like Shell. So moving on from individual consumers, it is a small step to consumer nations. The countries that import more energy than they produce. When it comes to oil, the United States is one of them. Consumer nations want energy supplies that are sustainable and secure. In response, energy companies will have to produce more energy, deploy more low carbon technologies and help to build a more diverse energy mix. Let me deal with the latter point, which is energy diversity now. At various stages in the history, Shell has invested in other segments of the energy market that most of you would associate us with. For instance, in the past, we had serious involvement in solar, forestry, nuclear power, and coal mining. Now, we saw all these interests because we, could, we found that others were better at it than we were. So, but that doesn't mean we have given up on trying new things. So, for instance, we are a technology leader in the biofuel space. We distribute more biofuels than any other company in the world, and we work very hard to build sustainable supply chains. It's not the first time that the industry has had to respond to concerns over supply security. In the aftermath of the oil crisis in the 70s, for instance, the industry gained greater access to the Gulf of Mexico, which today makes a vital contribution to America's supply. We would like to bring more oil to the U.S. market from the cold waters of Alaska, the most promising hydrocarbons basin in the U.S. We are facing legal opposition here. 
We have been working in Alaska since the 50, on land and at sea. We are confident that developing more of Alaska's resources would be a win-win situation for the state and local governments, the local communities and for the companies involved. In a different part of the world, we are currently pioneering the development of floating liquefied natural gas technologies. This would allow us to produce and liquefy natural gas on floating installations at full sea off the coast, of, for example, of Australia, reducing the environmental impact on land and sparing us and the government the costs of piping the natural gas to land over a long distance. So global supply security depends not only on opening up new geographic and technology frontiers, but also on recovering more from existing fields. Right now, on average, oil and gas companies produce 35% of the original oil in the reservoirs. The rest stays in the ground because it's uneconomical to produce. If we could increase this by just 1% worldwide, it could yield some 20 to 30 billion barrels of additional oil, which is as much as the, U uh, the U.S. today has as proven oil reserves. I use one example, a very positive one from Bell Ridge in California, where it's proved possible in some fields to produce more than 80% of the oil in place without enhanced oil recovery technologies. We would have been lucky to recover maybe 10%, given that the oil is very heavy. So getting more oil out of the ground is an area of common ground between those who want to produce and sell oil and those who want to buy and consume it. This brings me to the third group of customers, the countries that export oil and gas. So for international oil companies, the days of easy access to easy oil and gas are gone. Governments of countries with abundant resources want their societies to benefit, and they want more involvement by their national oil companies. The national companies have to address these development and aspirations. The entry ticket will be technology that makes a difference. We have other important things to offer, too, such as a global reach and a, a huge community of end consumers. So we also invest in local talents to actually develop those countries. So in the longer run, the distinction between producer nations and consumer nations will lose some of its relevance. For one thing, energy demand is surging everywhere, including in regions we think, of, we think of as oil exporters. Some exporting countries have already become or will soon become net importers. Think of Egypt, Indonesia and the neighbour Mexico. In addition, environmental awareness is growing, not only in North America or Europe, but in China, Latin America and the Middle East as well. The United Nations Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen in December offers a good opportunity to build bridges between consumer and producer nations and between the developed and the developing world. Shell's preferred outcome for Copenhagen would be a tangible progress in developing a global carbon market as a way of putting a price on emitting greenhouse gases. We need such a market as the most effective way of promoting low carbon technologies, in particular carbon capture and storage. A lot, not everything, will depend on how far the United States is prepared to push the agenda forward. There is a perception that the oil and gas industry is 100% opposed to congressional efforts to enact climate legislation. This is not the position of Shell. As a member of US CAP, we are actively involved in helping Congress enact a fair and effective cap and trade program. We recognize the value of such an option in spurring investment 
and positioning the United States as a leader in the coming international climate negotiations. Legislation that passed the House earlier this year is a step forward. Achieving this in achieving this. We will continue our efforts to improve this legislation as it moves through the Senate or to the Senate. Our customers, be they motorists or governments, all want at least some control of the, over the fire. And it's our task as an energy company to take that possible, to make that possible. So that's <clears throat> what will it take on our ends to be a successful global energy company in the 21st century. At a time of transformation, it is more important than ever that our people think in an integrated way, identifying where, it in, where in the energy system we can add most value for our consumers and obviously capture most value for our shareholders. Now, this is easier said than done. Shell's activities range from producing energy deep below the frozen water off the coast of Siberia to refueling millions of cars each day. Shell produces oil, sure, but you have to ask yourself what oil is for. That's when you see that we are offering people the possibility to travel. And our natural gas heats and cools homes, helps people to cook their food and lights their nights. By thinking about our activities in an integrated way, it will also be easier to innovate in the right direction. Innovation still is a key differentiator, perhaps even more so than in the past. Future customers will base their choices on more accurate information, which they will obtain more quickly from around the world. Winning companies will be the ones that stay ahead of the customer aspiration curve through innovation, pushing the limits of what is technically possible. The key innovation challenge is to produce more energy at the reduced environmental cost as the only way to keep all of our customers satisfied. Winning companies also will be successful at recruiting diverse people and diverse talents. In those areas where Shell is in direct contact with our customers, we need savvy people who reflect the diversity of the world's cultures. When we explore in the oceans for oil and gas and design and develop the big projects, the must-have is a t deep technical expertise. One of Shell's most demanding customers, President Obama, recently had this to say. We know that if we put the right rules and incentives in place, we will unleash the creative power of our best scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs to build a better world. Now, I can't say it as nicely as he does, but I would like to reassure President Obama that the challenge of building a better world already sparks our excitement and the motivation. Our favorite pastime is pioneering game-changing energy technologies. We are also realists. We have learned from experience, sometimes the hard way, that it takes time to develop and build a market for new types of energies. That's why a more efficient use of energy is crucial. Governments, companies, and all of, our, of us consumers, we will have to show leadership in that regard, the regard of energy efficiency. So I would like us to build a community of responsible energy consumers together, keen to pass on to future generations as many energy options as we enjoy today. Together, we choose the best path to a new energy future. Is that? Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation. Uh, and first question, this gentleman.
What is uh, Shell's current thinking about the potential of gas hydrates for future uh, natural gas supply? I think I would describe it in a, in a general way that I think in the United States specifically, I think we are underestimating what natural gas and gas can do for, for the economy and the climate. And this needs to be built into um, the, the business and the business behaviors and uh, policies and the guidelines for, for the go uh, from the government for um, uh, the development of these energy sources over the, the years and the decades to come. I think uh, without that, we will not um, achieve the goals we could achieve among the various, um, uh, various objectives which the U.S. has along climate change and uh, energy security. I think uh, I leave it at that as, as a key um, positive statement regarding gas uh, in this country for domestic use. All the way in the back, the young lady. I'm Holly Svandjari, the director of the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. Uh, could you uh, tell us your view of the Iraqi oil industry and where do you think it stands and where is it going? And also whether, I mean, Shell's involvement with the Iranian oil industry, because you have a history of pre-revolutionary Iran being involved in Iran. I'm would like you to talk about post-revolution and the current situation. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I start with Iraq and then go to Iran. I think in Iraq, you, <clears throat> we are looking at uh, the general development of the energy industry, oil and gas. We are um, currently negotiating a final agreement for what we call gas in South Iraq which is not about resources in the ground, it is actually about capturing the flaring of current um, associated gas and uh, make it available for domestic gas use and most probably later on for uh, LNG export. Um, we are pleased with the progress so far and uh, we hope to finalize that in, in due course. On the oil side, we participated in uh, the first round. Um, this was we won or were part of um, uh, two of the, the fields. One was um, as a leading operator in Kirkuk and one in the south. The conditions offered by the Iraqi government were not um, uh, to our liking in terms of um, not giving us sufficient um, profitability. And at the end of the day, we did not accept the deals. But we are in constant contacts and um, discussions with the Iraqi governments to take this forward. Um, there is a second round in planning, and uh, we do hope that the second round will be more successful for, uh, for both sides, the, the Iraqi governments and people, um, and the, the international oil companies. On Iran, um, Iran has huge gas and um, oil reserves, as we, as we all know. There is a lot of um, diplomatic efforts ongoing at this stage between the various countries in the world, including the United States and some Europeans and Iran, to, so, to uh, look for a di uh, diplomatic solutions to current problems. We have been um, involved uh, in Iran, but not in um, looking at uh, potential projects. But the way we describe this is actually we are looking at the design of such projects rather than uh, implementing such projects. So no final investment decision has been taken. Whenever we take such a decision, Shell will take the overall uh, political situation and stakeholder views into account. Um, I think that's all on Iran. Gentlemen here. Can you take the mic? Oh, it's maybe sorry. better for the others. Excuse me. Uh, your, your home country, uh, uh, which I presume is the Netherlands, uh, has uh, roughly uh, for, uh, derives about 40% of its electricity uh, from 
uh, industrial uh, heat uh, recycling. Uh, and uh, I think in the U.S. it's a very small percentage. Of, you know, the total cogeneration is roughly about uh, 7 percent, and there are largely regulatory barriers. Some uh, recent uh, science has indicated on the climate front that uh, black carbon, uh, essentially the particulates, uh, you know, th that would be associated with soot are responsible for roughly, uh, uh, you know, 55 percent of the total, you know, that would be uh, otherwise asso associated with carbon dioxide and radiative forcing. Uh, and uh, in industrial, uh, in developing countries, uh, cleaner cook stoves would be a quick way of getting that. But still, even in the, in the uh, uh, in the industrialized uh, uh, countries, uh, there could be great potential uh, for uh, movement in, uh, you know, that would reduce this. And uh, it, it, might, it would seem this might be a huge opportunity for Shell that's already very actively involved in this to really be able to promote this, where this is a means of really getting something that is not only perhaps zero carbon, perhaps gets even more than some of the renewables would in the near term. Yeah, thanks for the question, a very wide question, uh, touching on many issues. Uh, I take the easiest one up front. Uh, yes, I'm located in The Hague, but I'm actually Swiss, so um, <laughs> but that's okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think Holland and, and other countries are, are, um, are uh, developing uh, at many fronts at this stage their responses to, uh, to uh, let's say, climate change um, challenges. I'm not aware of the 30 percent, but uh, let's assume that's right. We're also uh, clearly working on um, carbon sequestration in Holland. We are actually using some of our CO2 out of the refining, um, the big refinery we have to actually heat up, um, you know, we, we say, and grow tomatoes, etc. So we are actually uh, 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 working on that as well. So we are involved in most of these, um, of these areas. Will it be a shell business in the longer term? That depends on scalability, that depends on uh, the results and uh, also on the profitability. As I said, we are, we are also a business, not, not a government only. So I think we are looking at all these uh, various um, opportunities and various possibilities at the same time, very closely linked to, um, to our work with Brussels in the European Union, but also with the work we do with the Dutch government. Um, so I think there, is, there are great potentials there. Uh, we are ready to take some of them, but we will certainly not be involved in all of them. And a lot is on trial stage at this stage. Uh, all the way in the back. Uh, Lee Patrick Sullivan, Clean Skies News. Um, ExxonMobil CEO Rex uh, Tillerson stood at that podium in January and said that he preferred a straight carbon tax to help deal with global warming. He said it's better for the environment, better for business. Are you saying from your speech today that um, Royal Dutch Shell prefers cap and trade over a straight carbon tax? That is correct. We have been standing for uh, cap and trade systems, not just in the U.S., but on a global basis. We are very actively involved in Europe. We are actively involved in, in the side design there, but also in the, on the trading side already. We are most probably one of the biggest traders in Europe on, on that. And we see it as, as more beneficial to go the cap and trade route because it, it, it establishes a market price and it establishes a, a system which allows actually governments uh, to set caps and reduce this cap. We do, we do struggle to see how this will work on, in a tax system, and that's why we are produ uh, preferring uh, the, the cap-and-trade system. And we hope that Copenhagen actually does give us clear guidelines on CCS um, and on cap-and-trade cap systems uh, so that we can continue to work on, on the frameworks and the implementation on a, on a regional and possibly on a global basis. Young lady. Uh, I'm Jill Shankleman, uh, a former scholar at the Wilson Center. Uh, I've been working on the Chinese uh, uh, oil industry. In fact, my report's one of the papers out there. And I'm wondering where, looking forward, do you see the balance uh, emerging in the relationship between Western companies like Shell 
uh, and the Chinese oil companies between collaboration, as there is in many projects worldwide at the moment, or in competition uh, over new licensing rounds. So where's that going to go? I think the oil and gas industry historically, and I would not see any difference in the future, um, has always um, worked in, in a col collaboration mode, in a partnership mode. This has a lot to do with the risks one does, in, uh, does take in, in bigger upstream projects. You need to spread them around. We have more than 20 such partnerships with NOCs worldwide, and we also do work with the Chinese on this. Um, quite clearly, you are also therefore in competition as well as in partnership, because A, they are uh, developing various um, project joint ventures with other companies, but they're also um, going alone for certain of these um, uh, projects or tenders. So I think we are already see today that we have both uh, sides. I think it is important to recognize what each company brings to the table when you go together. I think for us, the international oil and gas companies key are our uh, talent, which we bring to the table. So this is about uh, skills, uh, capabilities of developing large projects and not just one of them at, at any given time, so 5, 10, 15. Technology and innovation is the absolute key. So you need to st stay um, in front of, of all of your competitors, being it IOCs or NOCs. The technology and the innovation differentiation in the future will be even more um, important uh, compared to the past. Hence, Shell has reacted to that and has today the highest technology and highest innovation R&D uh, budget in the industry. And uh, we are determined to actually go through with that. So I think we are already there, would be the short answer to your question. We are in competition on the one side, but we are also in partnership. Uh, why don't we have two questions, two or three more questions. Why don't you, uh, both of you give your, ask your question and then. Uh, <clears throat> Charles Duran at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, if there were a substantial structural change in petroleum output, uh, or as you put it, uh, if there's a short-term petroleum crunch. It seems to me that Shell has positioned itself very well in terms of taking advantage of that situation, uh, particularly with what you said regarding natural gas. Is that a fair assumption? You want to take one more question and then the gentleman there. Hello. Will Harrington, I write for Inside Washington Publishers. You had noted that the House legislation on climate was a good start, but that it could be improved. Um, I'm interested how you think it should be improved in the Senate. Okay, on the, <clears throat> the first question, yeah, I said um, there is a risk of having increasing prices in the short, medium term because of um, clearly uh, reduced investments in the shorter term. Oil and gas investments are down 20% this year. Alternative energies are down by 40% according to international um, published uh, statistics. So if this continues quite clearly in, in a few years' time, when demand comes back, we will look at the supply situation which could be critical. Now, Shell's strategy in the past has been clearly focused on gas. And, and gas mainly to the hungry parts, energy hungry parts of this world, which is Asia Pacific. They predominantly they are oil price linked, so you don't have a gas price like in the U.S. in in the, in the Asia Pacific. So an increasing oil price indeed will give us an enhanced, an enhanced uh, profitability. But in addition, over the last um, five years we have actually shifted our portfolio in such a way that we are much more exposed to higher oil and gas prices. So we're actually operating in predominantly now up to 70% in so-called OECD countries, where normally your um, uh, upside uh, on oil and gas prices is higher than in, in some of the, the non-OECD countries where the creaming after a certain oil price for the government is very, very high. So I think I'm quite pleased with the portfolio today, both oil and gas side, which should actually give us a benefit in the longer term. 
The second question was, what do we need to improve to push this through the Senate? Is that the right summary? <laughs> That's a tricky question. Um, <clears throat> I will not address, I think, the, the isolated pieces. Um, I think, for me, important is, and that's for the whole industry, in my opinion, that we don't waste time. This comes as fast as possible. And this is driven by the thinking that if you want innovation and technology and fast implementation and going on and doing it, the oil and gas industry always needs a legal framework which is known and stable because we are investing for the next 30, 40 years. We are putting a lot of upfront capital either into projects or into R&D and we need to know where we are going. Um, and I think from that point of view, legislation in countries like the US, Copenhagen outcome are very important to give us the framework then to move on and kind of start to stop the discussion and actually go to work. So I have a very simple approach on this one. We are losing too much time, we are not fast enough, and we should actually move this through. So you can always criticize the various points um, and, and work on them, but I think for me the most important is time and clarity. You will take one more question. Uh, gentlemen, all the way in the back. I think you have two there. Probably. You have two at the back, so we two backs. may have to give you both of them. All right, so. both questions from the back. <laughs> Thank you. Ian Talley, Dow Jones. Uh, you were talking about uh, doubling or at least having half your production coming from natural gas. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly what year, 2012, I believe. Um, can you tell us why or what, what what's going on in your consideration of um, buying Conoco's uh, gas assets, or some of Conoco's gas assets. And the last question. Peter Piotrowski, Woodrow Wilson Institute. In light of the gas spats between Ukraine and Russia, what is your take on European energy security and your approach to Russian and Central Asian gas? Yeah, thanks. <sighs> This feels like a minefield here, but that's okay. So. <clears throat> Go through it. On the first one, um, quite clearly on natural gas in, in the U.S. has been a key driver for us, and I do confirm 2012 is when we are going at least to have 50% and increasing later on, so we are very much focused on integrate the gas on a worldwide basis. And the North American portfolio, which we have, plays an important role. We have over the last um, seven to eight years, we have actually, and very much the last two years, we have increased our portfolio in North American gas, both US and Canada, substantially through the acquisition of a lot of acreage, and now we are actually developing these acreages. And that's the, the way we, we develop a sizable gas business in the United States and Canada. Um, your Conoco remark is not something I'm going to answer and, uh, because we don't uh, comment on any rumors and I'm not aware of anything which is ongoing. So. Um, the second question is, is clearly a, a supply security question. And I think this applies for Europe, but it also applies for many other countries and the US is one of them. I think that to diversify your energy mix is an absolute must. Do you, if you are in Europe at the moment, there, is, there are a few strands you see, and I know that Brussels is developing an energy uh, security policy at this stage where they are looking at other resources uh, in order to have more independence uh, from certain providers of, of gas. I think we need to distinguish here two things. Gas in itself is a very steady supply source. You can produce this and it can run like oil or coal or anything else. So it is not the product itself which generates the insecurity. It is the management of the pipelines, it's the management between countries. And therefore, uh, we need 
to be careful. So gas is the right solution for, um, for Europe in the longer term. They need to get more independent uh, supply from various sources. Middle East LNG is one source. They have domestic gas and they have got Russian and Ukrainian gas and, and others. They are look, we are looking at Thai gas uh, opportunities in countries like Sweden, uh, Hungary and others, sim pretty similar to the North American Thai gas. So there are a lot of um, opportunities there. I think the European community needs to get its act together and coordinate uh, their energy mix strategy and their gas strategy. It cannot be solved on a country by country um, basis because the interconnections of the pipelines and the grids are just too, too far advanced that, they, that you can use or you can solve um, energy security issues on a country by country basis. Well, we thank you, Mr. Bozer, for your uh, insightful remarks. Thank you very much. much. And wish you much success for you and your company.